Hey, everybody, and welcome to this very special pro uh, broadcast. We are so excited tonight. I, I can't tell you how excited we are. I know Pete's uh, chomping at the bit as much as I am. So uh, if you haven't been on the show before, my name is uh, Chris Moore. I'm also known as the Tipsy Toaster, and you are on the uh, Interfleet Broadcasting. So we do a science fiction show that uh, based on uh, 1980s and 70s, but we mainly prioritize uh, Battlestar Galactica, and we uh, that's where our, main, our special guest comes tonight. So uh, with me tonight is uh, Pete. Uh, say hi, Pete. Pete's over. Hey, everybody. Hey. It's New York Pete. How's everybody doing tonight? Welcome to the show. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, quite excited, like Chris said. Uh, we have someone uh, with us that's going to enlighten us, bring us uh, back uh, in time and, you know, give us a little bit of background. Um, and I know that you guys are going to enjoy this. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to send them up and we're going to try to squeeze all those in. Uh, I already have a couple of them from you guys. Uh, so, uh, Chris, um, let's let's just get into it. So this is let's it. do our toast. This is it. Yeah. So let's do our toast. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh Thank you for being here and uh, at Interfleet Broadcasting. We really do believe that fans fuel the fleet. So uh, we try to do a toast every time to all you fans out there that have joined us live or recorded. Uh, and that's, uh, that's important. But if you're, if, you're not, if you're not here live, I mean, really, then, uh, then, then I really... You know, what is your problem? What is your problem? You should be here live. Uh, but anyways, so I would just like to say, uh, Pete, everybody, uh, fans fuel the fleet. Here's to you guys, uh, and Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays. Uh, we won't be back on the air again until afterwards, so if you do that, Happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, Kwanzaa, whatever it may be, uh, this time of year is uh, for family and for uh, and you are our family, so fans, feel the fleet. Here's to the fans. Mm -mm. All right, so Chris, uh, now that we got that aside... Uh, we had mentioned on our last broadcast, we said that we were going to bring uh, a very special guest, and we're very happy and proud to have uh, none other than uh, someone that was uh, integral to uh, putting together some of the greatest episodes of our beloved Battlestar Galactica 1978, the original uh, series. And today, tonight happens to be the 42nd anniversary airing date for the episode Fire in Space. Woo! So for those that are keeping track and, uh, and, and are top of this, uh, we have with us uh, none other than uh, Terry McDonald who wrote it. And uh, that's not the only episode, of course. Murder on the Rising Star, Take the Celestia, Mission Galactica, Cylon Attack, uh, and a couple of uh, other episodes that maybe we'll talk about if we have enough time. I hope, Terry, we can get you to comment later on on some of the uh, unproduced uh, screen plays that you'd worked on, the scripts. And um, here you are, Terry. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. It's awesome to have you on. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be here. Thank you, guys. So, um, Terry, uh, you were a part of, of a show that's beloved to us. And, um, man, it's it's been 42 years, and the fans still love this stuff. Uh, they read it, they're involved in it, uh, and, and to have you here with us to give you some insight is uh, quite the thing for us. Uh, I mean, you know, this is part of your life, and uh, we just want you to know that uh, it's touched us in many different ways, it's inspired us, and this show is because of Battlestar Galactica. So welcome, Terry. Uh, give us a little bit of, of background on Battlestar Galactica and how you got involved. Well, um, let me just start out by saying how much I appreciate you guys and, and the fans. Um, uh, means a lot. Um, what, you know, when, when we write an episode um, or we get involved in a show, we, don't, we, we do it and then we're moving on to something else. So we never know exactly um, what the response is going to be. Um, but the fact that this, is, this has survived um, in fandom for all these years um, is like, you know, we touch some people and that's, it, you know, it, it's, it's humbling in a way. Um, but um, I'm glad everybody has enjoyed uh, some of the things that we've done. Um, anyway, um, um, first of all, I have to start out by talking about my partner, uh, Jim Carlson. 
um, I met Jim Carlson um, in in the uh, somewhere around the it was in the early 1970s um, uh, at a run through of a game show, and the guy that uh, was was doing the game show um, said, "You two ought to get together because you have the same sense of humor." Now. Jim uh, was older than me, um, and he and I were like brothers from the instant we met. Uh, we both had the same um, deranged sense of humor, and um, <laughs> all during our professional career, all we did was laugh. You know, even if we were writing serious stuff that we'd make jokes about, no, let's write this. No, no, you can't do that. No, come on. No. So anyway. Um, I was working at the time um, on a, uh, a quiz show in my early days in the business called The Joker's Smile. This was the original version of the show, not the um, Snoop Dogg version. Um, <laughs> one day, yes. the producer who, uh, who was working on, on the show, he, had, he and his, his writing partner, his name was Ken Johnson, and he had been writing uh, The Six Million Dollar Man. He's been writing some episodes with his partner. And he came in one day, and he was really excited, and he said, I think they're going to make me producer. I think they're going to offer me the job. And as soon as he got that out of his mouth, I said, well, if you get that job, can I come in and pitch some stories? He says, yeah, okay. So he got the job, and um, Jim and I wound up going in and pitching and selling the very first thing that, that I had written, but certainly Jim had had quite so, uh, quite some experience before me, obviously. And um, we wound up writing four of those and two of the Bionic Woman episodes and uh, an episode of uh, uh, Gemini Man, which was the Invisible Man. And um, uh, I was dating a woman who worked at ABC for uh, one of the uh, one of the vice presidents, and apparently Galactica had been getting behind schedule because they only had Glenn Larson and Don Belisario writing episodes. They needed somebody else to come in and be the third person because of it took so long to shoot a show and they get the next script ready, and so they always wanted to be one script ahead. Um, and so she recommended us, and uh, Jim and I went in for an interview with Lacerio, and Don said, okay, he said, um, uh, credits, uh, we know that you can turn a script around quickly. Um, we uh, go home and, and write episode one of Patton in Space. And we said, okay, uh, that's a good way of putting you know it, this, too. Any idea what the story is? And I said, no, no, just, it's patent in space. So Jim and I went home, and he said, write Act 1 and bring it in tomorrow morning. So first thing we had to do, we went out to Jim's house. We, we sat down. We had to structure a story, um, which, by the way, has not survived. It's about the only thing that I've ever written that hasn't survived. But... Um, we turned in uh, the first act, and uh, we handed it to Don, and Don looks through the pages, and he goes, okay, he says, go home and write act two, and give it to me in the morning. And it was okay, so we went back to Jim's house, or actually, it was, uh, I had to stop off at home. Uh, no, it, forgive me, because it's like 40-some years ago. Um, <laughs> of course. So, Heck, I can't even so remember we what I had to, for breakfast, so you're lucky there. So we went to, we went to Jim's house, and uh, we wrote the second act, and we turned that in And the next day. And uh, we went back to Jim's house to start writing act three. And as I walked in the door, Jim had a glass of wine waiting for me. And he says, congratulations, story editor. So we were hired based on two acts of um, what became the living legend. We called it the last legend. Um, Com uh, uh, Commander Kane was, was, had a different name. I think it was, might have been Jedediah because 
of the, the, the biblical names and mythological names that, uh, that Glenn had used. And uh, we introduced Sheba in that script. And I found out about 10 years ago that um, Anne Lockhart um, took the job. She, didn't, she wasn't particularly interested in doing the show. And uh, she took the job based on those two acts that uh, Jim and I had written. So that's, oh, wow. anyway, that's how we got the job. Wow. Um, those, those two acts were thrown out, and Glenn took um, writing the two-parter. Um, and, uh, and we went on to, uh, to work on some other things. So that, that's the story of that. That's now, that's, that's actually interesting. Uh, so, Terry, in terms of then putting you on the track with Galactica, how, how was it introduced to you? Did it land with you? So this is what we got. We have a, a battle star or we have a ship or how did, was there a Bible for the story or how did they, how did they get that to you? Um, well, there wasn't a Bible for the stories. By the time, look, by the time we joined the show, um, So I watched them all, and so, and so did Jim, and we knew what it was. And we were stunned when we got the call to go on that show because we knew it was the hottest thing in television. And, you know, we couldn't wait to work on it. Um, so uh, in terms of the Bible, I wish there had been a Bible about things. Um, one of the stories that, uh, that I, I talk about in in my autobiography that I'm working on now is um, one day uh, Jim and I had gone up to Glenn's office um, because uh, I guess it was for a, a script meeting with Vincent Edwards who was doing um, uh, the, the, the Living Legend episode. And Vincent Edwards, for those of you who aren't familiar with him, he was an actor. He had a television series on in the 60s called Ben Casey, where he was a, a, um, a doctor. And uh, it was an interesting meeting because Vince was sitting on the, and Jim was sitting on the far end, either end of a, a long coffee table, and Glenn was sitting in a director's chair about three feet above everybody else, which kind of tells you the kind of a guy that Glenn was. Uh, so we had the meeting on his script, and when it was over, um, Jim went back down to our office, and what I had done is I had gone through all of the scripts that hadn't been produced and all of the scripts that had been produced, and um, I had notes. Uh, they were calling a sectan a centon. All <laughs> of the terminology was all screwed up. And so what I had done is I had taken everything and I had put it all in a little document and wanted to hand that out to Glenn and to Don so that they could refer to it so, that they, so everything could be consistent. Um, and so the audience wouldn't be confused. So on the way out the door, I turned around to Glenn and I said, Glenn, uh, would you mind if I, uh, I, I had a couple of notes on your story. <clears throat> this was the wrong way to approach Glenn. <laughs> I, could see, I could see Mount Vesuvius starting in his neck and it started <laughs> up into his face and he says, it was something like, what? Notes? And I said, well, it's just about the terminology. And he was so infuriated that I just said, well, never mind, maybe another time. And I walked out. And I never had another meeting with him. He, oh, wow. All he heard was that I had notes on his story. Yeah. So for everybody who's watching the show and wonders why things are called different things at times, ask Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Well, you know what? It's it's and, been a constant running. Yes. Almost, well, I don't want to say a joke, but it's all it always comes up inevitably. Talking to the fans, they'll be like, "Well, it, it was said this way, it was said that way," and 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 right. there's always it's always hard to pin certain things down. Um, so obviously, now we know. I I remember seeing an interview with uh, with Glenn, um, and he was uh, talking as part of a, a panel, and he um, that somebody asked him, somebody put him on the spot. And they asked him a, a question about the battle stars, and he said, "Ah, uh, I don't know. We're gonna have to get back to that later." And obviously, you know, based on on what we know now, I guess they they just didn't write that out before. They just I don't want to say winged it, but they had a story in mind and they were gonna keep moving forward. And so, all right, that kind of makes sense in that that uh, you know context. Yeah, I'm not sure we ever saw a Bible. I I don't know if wow. there was one. Maybe. In yeah, I, no, never saw it. But we knew the characters, you know, because we'd seen all the episodes. So. so, in terms of putting together something like Fire in Space, how did you know? How does that play out? As you, you just said that you you'd watch the episodes. So, where do you get that that vision? Okay, the first day we got uh, we arrived at Universal, um, which was fun because I'd never worked on a lot before. I mean, I'd gone in for meetings on lots, but I never had a parking space or or anything like that. So I'd park the car and I'd walk, I would walk to the producer's building um, and I would see uh, Alfred Hitchcock getting out of his car and going into his bungalow, see Edith Head almost every day getting dropped off and going to her costuming area. Um, so it was fun. It was a lot of fun. And so the very first day um, when we got there, Don Belisario took us down to the set. And they were shooting the episode with the Bores. Um, so we were down there for, oh, I don't know, maybe 15 or 20 minutes. And uh, we were introduced to Barry Nelson, who had the lead on the show. And this was particularly uh, interesting to me uh, because um, I knew even back then that Barry Nelson was the very first James Bond. Um, in the 1950s, there was a television show adaptation um, on a show called Climax, I think, with Peter Laurie and Barry Nelson of Casino Royale. It was an hour episode, or maybe it was a half hour episode, but anyway, it was pretty bad. Um, but <laughs> he was the first James Bond, and I just thought it was pretty cool to meet him. Um, so now we go back upstairs, um, and uh, we're just hanging around because our offices aren't, aren't ready yet. And so we were with Don, and Don finally said, well, Glenn wants to take you out to lunch. And I'm thinking, my God, this is, this is like, like a Hollywood movie. You know, you know first we're going, <laughs> I get my own parking space, and I'm, I'm seeing Hitchcock, and now we're, now we're on the set, and I just met James Bond, and now we're being taken out to lunch by this hotshot producer. And so we go downstairs, we get in the elevator, and Glenn isn't saying much of anything. We go downstairs, and there's his limousine to take us to lunch. So it, it's like, could this get any better? <laughs> well, no, it's everything got tale. worse. Oh, no. Here's what happens. He has his own driver. He has his limousine. We pull out of the garage um, at Universal. It's like 30 feet to Lancashire Boulevard. We pull out onto Boulevard, go about 100 feet, and turn left into the restaurant parking lot. <laughs> we couldn't walk over there. <laughs> he had to show off that he had a limousine and a driver. And he sat in the back seat with one of those little tiny TVs, and he watched. To, he turned on the World Series. He couldn't have carried it with him to watch the World Series. No, he had to show off the whole time. Oh wow! <laughs> so now we go into the now we go into the restaurant, and he basically told us what he wanted um, for the episode uh, Fire in Space. 
you know, and we thought it was a real good story. We thought it was really strong. Um, and I've told this story before. To, um, let me talk to you about the ending of the show because it's fascinating. Um, the, you never saw the original ending. The ending that oh. you see is that um, either Starbuck or Apollo, I forget which one, um, winds up floating on the hull um, above some explosives that are going to go off um, because he's he's moving uh, across the uh, the the um, the hull on these with the, these stanchions and he's moving across and one of them breaks loose coincidentally and now he's stuck floating uh, above where the explosives are <clears throat> and so the other one pushes himself off the hull and smashes into him and they go floating off into space where they're um, rescued by Sheba who saves them. Um, which brings up the question, since Sheba's flying a one, a one, uh, one seat Viper, how does she get those two guys back to the Galactica? But <laughs> I'm not gonna question. Um, that in was my, the end. In my version, it, they, they sent a shuttle out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> that's the only, but, but that's the only thing I can figure. Is, like, I've always had the same question. I'm like, how can that be? How can how can Sheba pick them up or she sees them? So what do they do? I'm, I'm guessing they sent, you know, maybe they, in my, my opinion, maybe they cut the scene. Uh, no, they, that, no, it, but it no. never existed. Why would they? Do, no, <laughs> I, I always thought maybe they were just laying on the hull while, while she flew it through space and then landed with them on. <laughs> Who knows? Anyway, so here's the ending. The original ending was, and you know, at the beginning, um, the here come the Cylons um, uh, on a suicide run uh, on the Galactica, and the one breaks through and gets into the. Um, into the landing bay and blows up, trying to blow up the whole ship. <clears throat> so as our guys go back out on the hull to set the charges, here come the Cylons again. And we know exactly what they're going to do because they did it at the beginning. And uh, the Vipers are out there, they're fighting them, they're, they're knocking them out of the sky, and one breaks through. And here it comes, right for where they're going to be setting the explosives. So what Starbuck and Apollo have to do is they have to set the timer to try and blow the Cylon ship up um, just in time, which they do when they take out the Cylon. Oh, more dramatic, more interesting. Oh, yeah. oh that's suspenseful. Great. Very cool. ABC wouldn't let us do it. What? And we said, why not? It's, this, is the, this is a great ending. They said, no, we, we've seen it before. We said, what do you mean you've seen it before? It says, yeah, we saw it before at the, at the beginning of the show. I said, that's the whole point. The whole point yeah. is, it, that's the setup. Now we know what they're going to do. We know how dramatic this is going to be. Nope. They would not let us do it, and we had to come up with that other, uh, with that other ending. And we fought and we shame. fought and we fought, and we finally had to uh, pick our battles, and that wasn't one of them. So. Yeah, that's yeah, you know, that's a lot of things do that way. You have to, oh, you have to wow. pick your battles when it comes down to this, and I'm sure that's uh, yeah, it's dog eat dog sometimes. You know, you want to keep your job and you don't want to anger your boss. <laughs> yeah, of course, and it's like, okay, you know, all right, that the, that was when the network had a lot of say in what you could canning. Couldn't good um, now, you know. Oh yeah. The now. last, you know, you do whatever you want, which is fabulous. I wish we had that luxury back then. So we did the best we could in those circumstances. Wow. Well, uh, Terry. As a matter of fact, um, speaking of writing, uh, we have a, a comment from John Jackson Miller. Uh, he's a sci-fi author. Uh, he's also done a lot of work with uh, comic book writing. He's involved in the Star Wars uh, franchise as well as uh, Star Trek, and he's done some novels with uh, the latest uh, Star Trek Discovery. But more importantly, 
he is he's also written uh, a Battlestar Galactica um, story for uh, comic book uh, a story. It's a trade paperback called Counter Strike, and he's uh, he's a fan of the show. He's a fan of yours and the classic, excuse me, Galactica. And he passed this on for me to to mention to you. He says, uh, "Fire in Space" was one of the best episodes, and one they should have done more like. It's a straight up procedural. It really engages the setting of the ship in an interesting way. Um, so, how does that sound to you, uh, Terry? Uh, I, I, it's absolutely true. Um, I thought that it was a fascinating uh, episode. See all different parts of the ship that you hadn't seen before, like the rejuvenation center. Oh yeah. Um, which I'm not even sure if they ever went back to that. Um, but. Uh, Everybody was in peril. There were three different stories going on. There were well, four different stories. There was a story of the bridge with Adama. There's a story of Boxy. Um, there's a story of uh, Apollo and uh, 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 Starbuck. And then there's a story with the Cylons. And everything, you know, we just cut intercutting and making sure that, uh, that everything was kept pushing the story forward and, and kept everything on edge. So, uh, John, I appreciate the comments. Thank you very much. And I would love to have a copy of your comic book. Seriously. <laughs> I didn't even know there was another Galactica comic book out there. Yeah. Uh, oh, there's oh, bunches yes. now. Uh, you forgot to mention, Pete, that he just won a, uh, the, uh, so there's a, a big Comic-Con called Dragon Con. And uh, he won the Dragon Con Award uh, for the Battlestar, that, for that graphic novel, Battlestar Galactica. Wow. Uh, Counter-Strike. Uh, he won Counter -Strike, the, uh, yeah. He won the, um, the yearly um, uh, graphic novel. So best graphic novel went to him and it went to Battlestar Galactica, which was the more important piece for us is, is saying it's still out there. It's still live. Uh, it's still available. Yep. That's very cool. Uh, I, I should also mention, by the way, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, well, Terry, there's, there's somebody uh, else uh, that just sent this up. Uh, his name is Sean. Uh, and he's also a, a big supporter and fan of uh, Galactica and IFB. And he says, um, what do you make of the fact that here we are 42 years later and Battlestar Galactica still resonates and matters to so many fans? What do you attribute it? it what, what do you think? What do you attribute it to in your personal opinion? Um, one of the things that Jim and I kept in the back of our minds was that um, we felt that everybody that was in the fleet, and particularly on the Galactica, was a family. And um, the, the essence of family we tried to keep um, throughout the show. I mean, the care that uh, uh, Apollo had for his son, um, you know, the loss of his mother. Um, uh, with uh, Adama, you know, you know, admiring and and still having to go head to head with uh, with Apollo, um, the friendship between Starbuck and Apollo, um, the the friendships with uh, with Sheba and um, Cassiopeia. It was all like a family, and I think um, if. If we were successful, we just wanted to keep the uh, that part of it alive, so that it was, you know, these these are people who are lost. There's they don't know where they're going, you know. They have to pull together. Um, so we wanted to keep that. We also wanted to to to, to write stories that were. Um, well, we were forced, let's put it that way. We, Jim and I were forced to do stories that were what we call bottle shows. And we called them bottle shows because Glenn would go off and he would write um, a two-hour, uh, two-part episode like The Living Legend or uh, uh, the one with the uh, the angels. I, I forgot what that one's called. Um, War of the Gods, maybe. Yes. Uh, anyway. Yes. Yeah. And he, they were so expensive to do because each episode was a million dollars or more, but now his were like $2 million or more. Um, 
there weren't enough special effects, we couldn't call a lot of new special effects. So we had to use stock footage of what we'd already, what was already in the bank. So we had to basically keep our shows fleet oriented without going to other planets or things like that. Ah. So because of that, we tried to keep the stories more personal. Um, you know, Starbuck has a girlfriend, an old girlfriend on one of the, yes. on one of the, uh, the ships. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, Take the Celestial. We were, we wrote, yes. we wrote one called Two for Twilly that didn't get, get made, but that introduced the aggro ship. Yes. Um, cause we hadn't even seen that. And, um, so we wanted to find out who was in the fleet, what kind of people were, were there, who were the ones that were resting, you know, um, did they have jails there? What, all kinds of things that you don't know. We wanted to explore. So it's kind of a long way to get to, to go around this. Um, I'm not sure why it resonated, but whatever we did um, was we wanted to have some heart in there um, and not just explosions. So does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it does. Absolutely. I love uh, I love There's... these uh, these these particular ones that are that let you know what's going on in the fleet because you always wondered what was going on in the fleet. You know, you you had all of the other episodes where you know the Galactic was in peril or things like that, but we never really got to see you know the re like, for instance you just mentioned earlier the rejuvenation center. What was you know what did they do in their off time? Uh, you know, those are the kind of things that the questions that were out there that the fans uh, would write fan fiction about, uh, but we you know we didn't get to those until the end and they really started to to bring out uh, a lot of uh person stories you know we found out that boomer is uh used to hot wire hover mobiles um <laughs> you know like wow you know excuse me excuse, <laughs> excuse me he hot linked hover mobiles <laughs> Yes, truly. Right. Chris, we, you stay correct. No, 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 no. Yep. ABC wouldn't let us say Hotwire. Oh, no way. That would, that, no, they wouldn't let us say that because that would give kids ideas. Wow. Oh. oh. I, I, okay, no, uh, I'm serious. Uh, let me tell you the best story of all about ABC. And it goes back to us working on The Six Million Dollar Man. Um, one of the episodes we wrote was called Nightmare in the Sky and Farrah Fawcett was in it. And at the beginning, she's, she's a test pilot, and she gets shot down in the desert it's a, in a one-place plane, it's experimental aircraft, um, by a Japanese Zero. And the original story was that the Japanese Zero was a hologram and they're bringing her aircraft can take it on the black market and sell well in our original story it was more than that um they they brought down experimental aircraft the next plane they were going to bring down was air force one with the president on board oh my. and they were going to use the experimental wow. aircraft to bribe another country to take the president and they would get the aircraft in exchange for that ABC would not let us do that because they thought that kids would want to build a, a, um, a hologram from the ground to bring down Air Force One and bring down the president. Oh, my gosh. I swear as I'm sitting Oh, my gosh. <laughs> wow. So Hotlink, yeah, they, they, they could control exactly the, the wording that they wanted. So it was like, oh, God, you know, we just roll our eyes and change it. I mean, Hotlink, okay, that's, that's actually better. It's, it's cooler sounding than hot wiring with all, with all due respect, Chris. Wow. Yep. Uh, so, uh, Terry, there's, there's, uh, there's uh, maybe some, some light that you can shed on a, a particular that goes on in uh, the episode Fire in Space, and it has to do with mushies. And Chris and I have debated this a while, and we've been reading it up. We, we, we you know, we Googled it, and, and we, uh, we've read some stuff, but, you know, you're here, 
So not to put you on the spot, but what do you do? You know anything about mushies? I know everything about mushies, um, <laughs> although I never had, uh, although I never had one. Um, mushies were simply cheesecake with green food coloring. No way. <laughs> Oh, there we go. Yeah. There's the secret. I, I was always thinking there were marshmallows. <laughs> Man, I thought it was Jello. <laughs> no, uh, uh cheesecake. Wow. Oh man, awesome. I'd actually eat that mushy awesome. for sure. Oh yeah. Um, there's a scene in Fire and Space where um, Boxy and Boomer and uh, are are in. They're trapped in a in a cabin. Um, trying to escape the flames and uh, the Daggett um, makes it through. And I think he had some mushies with him. And one of them, I don't know if it fell to the floor or what, or it, if it's just put down on the floor. But if you watch the Daggett in that scene, at the very, very end of it, the Daggett's head goes straight down to the floor. He's trying to eat them. And then they cut away. <laughs> But you know, I wonder if they gave it I, I don't to know. Evie. Yeah, yeah, Evie was something else. Well, uh, so so Terry, just you know, moving along a little bit more on uh, on the episodes, uh, Murder on the Rising Star, uh, another one of the great ones, in my opinion. <laughs> um, Chris had just mentioned uh, the uh, the idea of getting to know other um survivors and backstories so i remember watching this in its first run and as we were going through the show and the series it, it was it was fascinating to imagine you know how difficult it was to survive this major catastrophe and whatever happened to the you know these other survivors you know there must have been people that weren't all as good as the ones that we're seeing. So we're, we're getting, uh, you know, this bird's eye view on, you know, some of the heroes, um, some of them, you know, waver, but murder on the rising star, all of a sudden we're seeing, wait a minute, there's some cutthroats that are out and about. And I was, oh man, I was blown away. I was like, this is one heck of a great story. Cause we're getting, you, you, you've teased out a little bit of, yeah, well, you know, some of these people did things that they may or may not have regretted, but I, I just thought it was awesome. Thank you. And, and it, it makes me laugh only because I know the backstory of all of this. Um, the first thing I want to talk about um, on Murder on the Rising Star is that one of my very, very first jobs, it was my first, it was my first job, more or less when I moved out here uh, was in the mail room at ABC. And um, I met a guy who was also working in the mail room named Rod Holcomb. And Rod and I became very, very close friends. And we would hop on his motorcycle and drive out to, uh, to Westwood and, and go see all kinds of movies. He wanted to be a director. I wanted to be a writer. We'd go see, foreign films, Bergman films, and Woody Allen films, and everything. And then we'd go out to eat and we'd discuss them. And we often said, you know, wouldn't it be fun if someday um, you got to direct something that I wrote? And as it turns out, Murder on the Rising Star was that episode. Um, Rod had come up through the ranks on The Six Million Dollar Man, and they put him on this particular uh, story, and I thought he did a really good job. And it was it's very, very cool to to have that experience in my life with, with somebody that I thought was was uh, was talented and had the same dream that that I did. Um, the original this this was the um, the show with uh, Triad, wasn't it? Yes. 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 Um, okay. One of the things they came to us with, they said, we would like to have triad in, in this, but we don't know how it works. And they, they, <laughs> didn't even have, they, had, they had no diagram. They didn't have a set. They didn't have anything. But I had done game shows. And so um, what I 
Jim and I imagined, I think I came up with the original idea, was um, a big plexiglass arena that they play in where there's no gravity. So they can bank themselves off the walls and um, the ball would would be moving differently. It was, we just thought it was a really, could bounce, bounce it off the ceiling. Um, we just thought it was like, think, think of racquetball, but in zero gravity. Um, and we, we said, look, we know we, you can't do this, but this is our idea. And uh, Jim and I even came up with um, some rules for the game, and I still have those somewhere. Oh, that'd be cool. Uh, oh, wow. I, I think I think those are going in the book. Um, not everything works, as I recall, but <laughs> a lot of it does work. And I thought, yeah, maybe maybe um, someday when we're out colonizing the planets, they'll they'll find these pages, and I'll be the father of whatever they call it. Um, <laughs> anyway. Anyway, so that was that was a, a triad. Um, I I always laugh when I see the uh, the uh, uh, Apollo and Starbuck wearing brassiers. Um but uh, that was Jean Pierre's choice. I, I don't know <laughs> what that yeah, he, was all about. He did talk about that in his interview about uh, how he put that. Oh, together. he did. Yeah. Yes. So, yes. Interesting. Um. The other part of it was um, Jim and I, I can't honestly remember if Jim and I came up with this story by ourselves or if Glenn said, I want a murder story. I just can't remember. Either way, we had one. And uh, so we had turned in a bunch of stories on a Monday and Wednesday afternoon at like four o'clock, we get a call and they said, Glenn wants you to do um, the, the murder script. Um, we need it in Mimeo that's, uh, at uh, 7 o'clock Friday morning. So we what? had 36 hours or so to write it. Holy crap. So Jim, so wow. Jim and I looked at each other, and we, we, had, we just had a, a, you know, a basic, basic kind of plot. We didn't have it all worked out. So we had to work it all out first. And then we, you know, he, he took an act and I took an act and then we edited him and we took, he took an act and I took an act and we edited him. We didn't go home. We didn't sleep. Um, and it was in Mimeo at uh, seven o'clock morning and they pretty much shot it the way it was. So when, I don't. Uh, I was practically hallucinating because I was asleep for so long. Oh God! And so I'm flabbergasted that people like it because all, all I remember is the pain of it. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, I. Uh, uh, it was. Oh, here's here's a here's another thing. We had worked with Brock Peters. Um, if you don't know who Brock Peters is, you should know him. He played um, magnificently um, the black man who was accused of uh, assaulting um, a girl in To Kill a Mockingbird in the oh. movie. Okay. Oh, yeah. And fabulous actor. And he was in one of our episodes of The Six Million Dollar, uh, The Bionic Woman. And we thought he was so good when they were looking for a, a person to play um, Solon, um, the, the more or less the attorney. Um, we recommended Brock Peters, and I'm so glad he did it. So I basically had a chance to work with him twice. Um, and uh, there was, let me also just briefly talk about a um, there was apparently a script that had been written by another writer called fire in space and uh, it was a two-part episode um, and this was in the very very early days long before we got there we never saw the script um, and 
And then Glenn took us out to lunch and told us to, to write this episode about fire in space, because apparently in that script, the fire in space until episode two. So I don't know why you would call it that in episode one, regardless. There was also apparently a murder in one of the episodes. And so um, we never saw that script until very, very, very late in, in the, in, I think we were in the middle of doing um, Take the Celestra when it, it found its way to our desk. And I read it over a weekend and I can't remember for sure, but it seemed like, and forgive me if this is wrong, because I don't want to, to, to <laughs> uh, uh, the fans will forgive anyway. you. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, I think, I think, um, they, uh, when, when they're on the witness stand, they have a, a helmet or something, or they hold something that for them to tell the truth, you know? And so they're asking them about where were you and blah, 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 and this and that and the other thing. And I remember looking at Jim and saying, why don't they just say, did you kill him? <laughs> well, that makes sense. <laughs> you know, and that's my only comment about that. So we had nothing to, we had nothing to do with taking anybody's storylines or um, anything like that. We, in all the years that I've been in this business, I, I never felt that I had to steal somebody else's idea. So wow. um, anyway, so that's, that's, I think those are my notes about uh, that particular episode. So Terry, then um, there's, there's take the Celestra, I guess is, is up next. If we were going to, you know, just talk about yeah. the shows themselves. Yes. Can, can you give us some insight? And uh, particularly, was there any character uh, that you enjoyed writing about the most? And that comes from uh, our friend John One. Hiya, John. Thank you for the question. Um, well, in terms of um, outside characters, um, I... I wish I had written for Fred Astaire. I, I did contribute a little bit, Jim and I, a little bit to uh, uh, The Man with Nine Lives. Uh, but actually, uh, two characters on, on this particular episode uh, we liked writing for. Um, one was, um, was it Aurora? Was that the, the girl's name? Yes. The, uh, the, yes. the former girlfriend of Apollo. Because we thought that that dynamic was very, very, interesting particularly since Cassiopeia uh, in the scenes and she knew what was going on um, so there was a lot to play with with that we thought that was interesting we also thought that uh, Commander Cronus played by Paul Fix and uh, if you've ever seen any of the old episodes of the Rifleman with Chuck Connors Paul Fix played the sheriff named Micah um, on those oh, episodes yeah. so so I knew who he was and solid actor. Um, we thought he played it extremely well. Um, and uh, so it was, it was more of a tyrannical type of, of commander. Not quite, um, but we enjoyed playing that because it was, again, a different kind of uh, uh, character that we hadn't seen before. Uh, this is also the episode, by the way, where Jim and I to the mat on um, with ABC about their intrusion into the show. Um, there, at the beginning of the episode, um, I forget what's going on on the Galactica, but over on Commander Cronus's ship, the Celestra, um, there's a mutiny because of the way the commander is allegedly um, treating the soldiers. And so a firefight breaks out in the landing bay. And now you cut back to the Galactica and they're doing whatever they're doing and Apollo and Starbuck are getting on a, a shuttle to go over there and do something. And we cut back to the um, firefight and they walk into it. And so now they're in the firefight. 
And so then we cut back to the Galactica to see what's going on back there. And then we cut back to the Celestra and the fight is still going on. And then we, we're back at the, at the Galactica with Lorne and with uh, uh, the, other, the other people. And now we're back to the firefight. Well, ABC had a rule on all of their shows, said you could only do, I think it was six, it might have been seven, acts, acts of violence um, per show. Now, an act of violence was like somebody hit somebody, or um, there's, uh, you know, they shoot a Cylon off of a horse or something like that, you know. And what they were doing on this show that we had like 12 acts of violence and we said what every time we cut back to the galactica and then cut back to the firefight they considered it a new act of violence and we're saying <laughs> it's the same fight all we yeah. have, all we're doing is cutting away and and they wouldn't let us go and finally jim had enough of the woman we were talking to and after we hung up he called the head of standards and practices at abc and told him what was going on. And the head of ABC said, that's fine. Do it your way. Wow. So um, at least we saved that part. God knows what, maybe we would have had a pie fight. <laughs> <laughs> I, may, I imagine, I imagine she's, uh, it wasn't your friend after that. Oh no, that, that was fine. You know, we, we didn't. They, you know, they couldn't do anything that we went over their heads. They were probably just going by the letter of the law in the book, um, and so with no black and everything is black and white, and there's no gray. So um, we could have lost that, but we did it, and we won. So, Terry, I got a quick question of my own, uh, Commander Kronos. Uh, who, whose idea, if you remember, was it to make him the mentor of Adama? It was probably, it might have been ours. I just don't remember, honestly. Um, we just, you know what? It probably was us because we wanted to, to make it, uh, like I said, we were doing personal stories. And so it just sounds like something we would do to make it more personal for um, a member of the Galact the, the, the Battlestar itself, um, that, it, that relationship between the two of them, um, I thought was fun to write and it, it was fun to watch played out. And, and to, Nobody and ever to asked put me you that even before. more. I just don't remember. And, and to put you more on the spot, Terry, uh, whose idea <laughs> was it, do you know, to do the salute the way they did? which is very interesting. We'd never seen that before. That may have been a director's call. Oh, wow. Okay. Interesting. Because I don't think that uh, we put anything. That would have been a stage direction. And we would have said they salute, probably. So the director, okay. or maybe the actors came up with it. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Um, so, Terry, we um, we then have... Mission Galactica, the Cylon attack, also as part of your direct involvement. And that's a fan favorite. I got to tell you, I actually own the VHS. I bought that VHS when it came out, and I was, like, thrilled when we got to see that. I, I thought it was, uh, you know, there was a lot of action, and, and we got to see some other things going on. Um, can you give us some insight? Well, you know, it was a surprise to us. Uh, because all of a sudden, um, fire in space is is alive and and well and and uh, in this movie that's being released all over the world. Um, so we thought that was very very cool. I have a a big poster of it um, downstairs on my um, on my living room wall that that's been signed by almost everybody that was on the series, with the exception of Lorne and uh, John Kalikos. John had passed um, before I could get it signed by him. Um, but I thought it was a pretty good melding of the, the two episodes. Um, they took all the, the, the cool action sequences from Fire in Space and 
you know, Lloyd Bridges is great as Commander Kane. They were going to bring him back in two um, if there had been a season two. Um, no, that's, but, one of the, um, that's one of the fan questions coming up. So, we'll Oh, okay. <laughs> well, we'll get to that then. Okay. I'll, I'll talk about that there. All right. Okay. Well, so, um, so Terry. Uh, go ahead. No, I, I was just going to say, uh, I, I don't know what else to say because we'd already written Fire and Space, and then this was a big surprise. Fair enough, Terry. Um, I, 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 I'd be, uh, I wouldn't be happy if I didn't, uh, if I didn't try to bring back up. You mentioned the autobiography, and that's something that I think uh, all of us would like to read. It's, it's, uh, it's going to be a while yet. I mean, uh... I, 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 look, I'm, I'm four hundred pages in. Oh wow! I've had a long career. That's... I've worked on lots of shows, and I have anecdotes about everything. Uh, as you could, as you could tell just by tonight, um, I have a lot to say about. And, and for some reason, I have one of those brains that just locks in information. So and we um, love it. That's a great thing. I'm, I'm done with. I'm done with. The early years, I'm done with primetime shows. I'm finishing up the animated series, and then I've got a bunch of game shows to write up. So it's, and it's long, so I'm going to have to cut. So it, it's, we have, I do yet, but it's nice that we're, ha we're in the middle of COVID because I've got the time to, uh, to noodle with it. So, right. but, but, uh, you, you'll be you'll you'll be the the among the first to know. Awesome, well, that would, I can't wait. Excellent, uh, Terry. While while you were on um on the set, you'd mentioned that you'd been on a few times. Um, did you ever get any feedback from from actors? I know that once in a while, some of the actors might you know get involved with uh you know writers or or sometimes they'll they might be um you know, an idea or two, or sometimes they even say, hey, this doesn't sound like what they would say, or, or it seems a little out of character. Uh, did you ever encounter anything like that? Um, well, we were down on the set um, a number of times. The very first time um, we went down to the set, uh, other than to see um, James Bond, um, on fire in space because that morning they were going to blow up the bridge. And so we wanted to go down and see that. And so did everybody else. So not everybody from the office was down there. Um, and um, so everybody's in position and um, there's uh, 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 an explosion that just sounds like poof, not much of anything. And then there's a big puff of smoke and the stuntmen hit little trampolines that were hidden in, you know, behind the, uh, uh, the equipment and went flying over uh, uh, everything. They dropped um, um, like, uh, what's the, uh, what's the material that they make like fake snowmen out of? Uh, you mean like styrofoam? Course. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> the styrofoam stuff falls from the ceiling that looks like pieces of metal. Um, and then they did it again. I think they did it at least twice. And everybody would applaud, and then everybody get back into position and, and do it again. And then um, there's where the um, – there's a big map, a big glass map. Um, oh, yes. That's one and of uh, all of a sudden, it just shatters. And they oh. wired that from behind, and um, they hit a button, and there was absolutely no sound, and it just disintegrated. And then there was applause. So, <laughs> um, so while we're on the set, um, we decided to go over and introduce ourselves to Lorne Green. And Lorne gets us aside, and... Lorne, God bless Lorne, um, but he he had a great voice. I don't know if you know this about Lorne Green, 
but during World War II, um, Edward R. Murrow was the voice of America. He was the news guy in America who really delivered the news. Mm -hmm. In Canada, it was Lorne Green. Oh. And Lorne oh. invented something that I used when I was a radio disc jockey, the backwards clock. He invented that because when he was doing his broadcast, he wanted to know how much time he had left. And so it would count backwards from 30 seconds to zero. So Lorne's voice was spectacular. And so he gets us aside and he starts talking about the show and he was welcoming us to the show. He was very gracious. And he says, now gentlemen, he says, I don't have to have every line, but what I do say, and he rocked back on his heels, he said, has to be important. <laughs> I can see that. I can see that. And so we said, well, okay, thank you. And every time we went down to the set after that, we saw Lauren coming our way, we left. <laughs> because Lauren had been up at a bit our we were in the middle of a murder on the rising star and, and Lauren just dropped into our office and we're fighting a time deadline and he sat on our couch for two and a half hours and told us which were interesting oh wow but we were at a deadline so we just didn't want to get caught in a situation where um um because we were delivering exactly what he wanted we never got any complaints um, and we often had lunch with Richard and uh, Dirk um, because they wanted to talk us about their characters. And, um, you know, we felt we were doing exactly what they wanted, but Richard always wanted more funny lines. And to us, the beauty of the relationship between Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and Apollo and Starbuck, if you mm -hmm. will, was that one of them was funny. The other right. one was more the straight guy. Right. And um, so we never changed anything. But apparently, they Richard finally went to Glenn and um, complained about it. And in one episode, and I don't remember which one it is, if you notice Richard is having all getting all the joke lines, it's because Glenn changed all of Starbuck's lines and gave them to Apollo and gave all of Apollo's lines to Starbuck. And oh, I don't wow. know if it worked or not, but we're happening again. Yeah. Huh. Terry, so, there's some. Yes and no. I'm done. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry. I think I cut you off. Go right ahead, Terry. No, no I, I thought I'm done. Yeah. Uh, there is, uh, and there's a couple of other, uh, obviously there's, there's a few other episodes. Um, and what, what other involvement did you have in the rest of the show? Um, Don would come up, would come up every once in a while and he would say, um, Oh, like uh, for for triad, you know, we had to come up with oh, in in the uh, uh, the man with nine lives. Uh, they're in uh, they're in the bar, which, the rising star, and um, in the background, you can hear a triad game going on. So Jim and I wrote all that dialogue that you hear. It's voiceover. Um, anytime. Uh, uh, during Fire and Space, um, the, there were all the shots of the people fighting the fire. Um, we would write wild lines for, the, for actors to go in and record, and they'd play that over that scene. So we did little things like that. We were coming up with storylines all the time. Um, so... In, in Murder on the Rising Star, Don came up to us and he said, um, I need some kind of a weapon for the no men. And he said, I, I can't come up with anything. So 
uh, Jim and I sat down and we said, okay, these guys are like desert dwellers and they're probably less sophisticated tech technology wise than um, the guys on the Galactica, but they still must have some kind of technology. So let's take, let's take a weapon that's pretty basic and jazz it up a little bit. So we came up with the laser bolts. And those are those two bright um, balls. It's like a, a bolo um, that they use in South America to, to bring down animals and I guess people running and things like that. So uh, we thought, wouldn't it be cool that once they were pulled off of uh, uh, their outfits, they were when they threw both of the balls at the same time, a laser beam would cross between both of the balls and it would slice in half anything that was in the way. So that's where that came from. So, um, you know, we had, most of the time we were either, we were writing or uh, coming up with stories um, or helping uh, some of the other scripts, uh, except uh, I, I, we never touched anything of Glenn's again after that incident that I had up in his office. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is cool. What, what's the name of the, the, the no man, the, the guy on the far right, the, the lead guy? Oh, now Do you remember what us. his name was? Char Lance Legault? Well, that's, his, that's who he really is, but I didn't know what the character's name was. But anyway, it's Lance Legault. This is cool. Um, if you're an Elvis Presley fan, um, Lance was his stand-in in a lot of his movies and also had some bit parts in the movies. But what's even cooler is in like 1969, Elvis had a one-hour television special um, where he returned to music. He's all in black leather and he's basically just singing for the hour, um, his rock and roll hits and everything else. The guy on drums is Lance Legault. No way. Wait. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's cool. Well, there's, there's a trivia question for you. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. That's a, that's a good one. Um, so, uh, Terry, there's, um, there's a particular episode uh, later on in uh, the series itself where um, Apollo uh, dies and it seems like he's resurrected and there's the ship of lights and there's these other beings and they're like possibly angels and uh, I think I think uh, there's something behind that that you might be able to shed some light on uh, no pun intended because there's always been this question about okay. you know what happened with yeah, there's a couple of things about that that there's a bunch of things about that the, the scene by the way where apollo um is on the table and the the beings of light are, are around him um had to be reshot because um whoever the set designer was on the show um he used shower curtains behind it, and it looked like shower curtains. And so everybody was referring it to it as the shower curtain scene. So this is much cooler, what we're looking at now. Um, oh, wow. There's, um, there's been a question about that episode. Oh, it's, on this particular episode, um, Glenn couldn't figure out what to call uh, Patrick McNee. He, he didn't know what name to call him. And so um, we dug into um, uh, various religious names uh, that people use for Satan. And in, uh, in Islam, uh, Ib Iblis or Ibli um, is the name for, for Satan. So we thought that it would, would be cooler um, with a name like that, because most people don't know that. Um, and as I'm looking at this, by the way, it reminds me that um, when they first go down to the planet, um, everything was shot in infrared, which gives it that 
ethereal look. And for some reason, when they returned to the planet, it wasn't shot in infrared. It just looks normal. And that's because they ran out of money. So they didn't have oh. enough money to um, do more infrared photography. Now, when they go down the first time um, or the second time, um, they look uh, and something is in the ship. Something is, is in the ship that makes them know that he's the devil, basically. And everybody wonders what it was. Well, again, um, ABC wouldn't let us show it because they thought it would scare the kids. And the way it was written in the script, it was there were some cloven hooves showing ah. in the ship. Now, Interesting. So I guess if you want to kill a devil, you have to crash land your spaceship. <laughs> um, now we but, know. Um, but part of me wants to say, I saw that in dailies, and another part of me is saying, I don't think they shot it. It's like it was the one shot that I wanted to see, I remember. Um, but that's what it was supposed to be. So um, those are my stories about that particular episode. All right. Well, Terry, we have, uh, we have a, a, a few questions from some of the fans. Uh, Lola, she says, whose idea was it that their average age of life was 200 years? I don't know. I don't even remember that. <laughs> that the people on the Galactica could live 200 years? I I just don't remember that. I'm sorry. Um, um, but, of course, it was my idea. So, yeah, I, I, I and a good that. idea at that. <laughs> uh, there's, there's, there's another question. John McCartney wants to know, quick question. In your opinion, could classic Battlestar Galactica be brought back in the same vein as the original and be successful. Everything nowadays is so dark and brooding. Could the same crew from the original be involved, writers, set designers, etc., on some level and make something reminiscent of the original? Boy, that's a really good question. Um, they, I've often been asked that if I was invited back to do the show, would I, would I have gone back? And you bet I would have in a heartbeat. Um, because it was just so much fun. Basically, it's like when you work on a cartoon, anything that you can dream up, they could shoot, um, which makes it particularly interesting. Um, you know, I'm, I don't know if it, w it would work. Back. Look, we couldn't do um, more adult stories on, at the time. We did what we could do. You know, they ordered a box and we had to build a box. We couldn't build, um, you know, a geodesic dome. Um, but I think if there was a, sh a show that's as long as it, look, Star Wars works and it's all about family, really. Um, so I, th I, th think it could. I thought that, I got to tell you, I thought that the Galactic had the coolest spaceships of, of any show. I just thought they were fabulous. Um, and if, if the Cylons could be deadly, you know, uh, instead of just being um, there, really, yeah. uh, that would have been more <laughs> interesting for us. It, make them a threat. Um, it, it, uh, it, it makes the stories, uh, deeper and more visceral sometimes so um i would i would love to be part of that if they ever tried to bring it back in some way um that's a good question thanks I like that uh there's another good one uh, in a similar vein from eric Patton or Patton. uh some years ago it emerged that glenn had prepared a memo regarding plans for the second season then included eliminating several characters and, among other things, killing off Shiva in the season opener. Do you remember any discussion regarding plans for the second season, or did the cancellation come before that could be thought out? Um, 
one day about, it, it was probably the last week we were on staff, uh, Glenn and Don took Jim and myself out to lunch. We did get in a limousine and go across the street. <laughs> we went we, we went like <laughs> two miles this time. Um, and we went into the restaurant. I remember there was a, a bronze plaque on the table that said Glenn Larson. Um, so he obviously ate at this very fancy restaurant all the time. This was his table. And Glenn wanted us to pitch him some stories that we might have been working on. So we only had little bits and pieces of things um, because we had just finished up um, Take the Celestra and we were waiting to find out if we were going to get another assignment or not. And, you know, we were noodling with some things. And so we pitched him what we had um, and he didn't react to anything. Um, hmm. So now you fade to black and you come up about, I don't know, six or seven years ago. And I found out that through people that I know, that there was a document floating around that was up for, up for auction mm -hmm. um, on, uh, on eBay. And I went and I looked at it and I bought it. So I have perhaps the only original copy of season two. Huh? Um, it had uh, some color photographs in it, uh, not photographs, color drawings of, of, of various things. And there were five or six storylines that uh, Glenn had come up with. Um, and after I read it, my particular comment on it was, I didn't do season two because I thought that they were all, all stories were derivative and not particularly interesting, at least the way they were laid out. And they were short, you know, they were like a page and a half. They weren't in any detail. So um, perhaps that's an unfair uh, critique. Um, but in the first episode, um, and they had even talked about this during uh, the first season, that they were going to kill Sheba off and bring her back as a man. Wow. What? Um, yeah, she was going to be, she, she, her clone, she was going to be cloned, but it was going to be a guy. Something like that. Well, that's one sure way of getting a um, recast. Oh, wow. Uh, oh, of bad. course. You know, and I, I'm not sure that Annie Lockhart knew that at the time. Thought that Sheba was a really good character. She was. Oh yeah. Um, and she was oh hell yeah. She was the, wasn't she the first female fighter we ever saw in science fiction? Basically. Well, it was Just, some of the well, women, and uh, the the, the uh, number three had uh, was on there, but uh, you know. Yeah, but like, the, this was yeah. before that. Yeah. So it was, it was just, I, one of my favorite characters. Yeah. She yeah, I like I like that character a lot. I like strong women, so that was really I could sick my teeth into that. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Terry, that I think that leads us into uh, some of the work that you had done with unfinished or unproduced um, scripts. Uh, two for Twilly, for example. Two for Twilly, I thought was a really good script oh yeah um, i just i just read it the it, other was, day. it was um, really good um it's um twilly is the guy who is basically um the the number one mechanic on the fleet again we were looking for a, a show where uh, we could introduce people uh that you might be interested in who were along for the ride and um there was a there's a sub oh, incidentally the story um was given to us by the standards and practices person at, at abc she th she had seen a movie called um um god i'll think of it in a second it was an alec guinness movie uh, Cap captain's paradise Okay. And it was a British film from the early 50s, and it's about uh, a ship captain 
who uh, lives in England with his wife, and then he goes off, you know, on his voyages. And then he comes back like six months later, a year later, and he's with his wife. Well, in the meantime, he's got another wife somewhere else. <laughs> so he goes to see the other wife. So we thought we could have some fun with this and still write a compelling story. So um, it was it was about Twilly having to repair a ship that uh, that uh, the agro ship that uh, Apollo and Starbuck are on, which um, has lost its bearings basically, and um, while he's trying to repair it, um, his wife is is on the ship visiting him, and he doesn't know that his other wife is also on the ship, and he runs into her, and now they got to keep the two of them apart. And so he can't concentrate, and he's putting things in wrong, you know, and Starbuck and Apollo are beside themselves, and the aggro ship is now listing into a mega sun, and there's going to be no way that they can turn it around. Well, ultimately, everything works out, and at the very end, um, Twilly, is, his marriages are dissolved, and he's very contrite, and he walks off camera, and then you see him, he's on the, he's on the phone talking to his third wife that he'll be home in just a little while. <laughs> oh my God. So we, we thought it was, it was cute. It was a nice little twist at the end. So we don't know if a, they didn't do it because the special, they'd have to do special effects for it or B, which may be more likely Glenn was a Mormon. Right. And so, so was this making fun of his ah. faith, which we had no intention of doing. Um, it, this was simply um, taking the initial storyline and playing with it a little bit. But it was fun to write. We liked, we liked that script a lot. And I, I, I often thought that would have made a great episode for season two. So, uh, Terry, uh, we have a, a, another great question, and it has to do with the Cylons. Uh, this is from John Van Gostein, and he asks, were you happy with the Cylon Supreme Leader? Was there plans to write more on them or have more Cylon episodes? Cylons rule. Well, are you talking about Lucifer or the Imperious Leader? Uh, the Imperious Leader. The Imperious Leader. I hadn't heard uh, about any of that. Um, if you notice, about halfway through the series, the Cylons weren't around anymore. Mm -hmm. And we had some neo-Nazis for yep. one group. Um, Eastern Alliance. And that was Eastern because, Alliance, yep. Yeah, because um, the Cylons were not a threat. And everybody knew it. So they were looking for somebody who was more threatening. Well, yeah, okay, now you got neo-Nazis there. Can't kill anybody either. So they're not a threat. So I th they were looking for something. And that's why... When Jim and I would write um, stories, particularly two for Twilly, uh, we made a, a very, very serious situation with the aggro ship listing into a mega sun. And Boomer and some, some other people from the Galactica have to go out uh, on a shuttle and try and push the, uh, the ship out of, out of the way, almost like a tugboat. To, to get it uh, away from the gravitational pull of the thing. So there's the threat. That's a good threat, particularly because it's the aggro ship, and there goes all their food. If, and it, if that it's ship a viable threat, lost. too, yeah. Yeah. So that's what we were trying. Um, obviously, uh, if it came back, I don't know what they would have done uh, with uh, – if, no, if there's no threat, you got no story. So Yeah. Eric wants to know – um, that he, he's under the impression that Jamie Lee Curtis read for a part as one of the wives. Is that correct? Yes, she did. That's I forgot that. Yes, she did. We had a, we had two we had a reading for two for Twilly. Uh, Jamie Lee Curtis came in and she she had only done Halloween and she had just done it. And uh, she started reading, and she got the giggles. She just started laughing. 
I don't know if it was written funny because it was this guy trying to juggle two wives or if she was nervous. We don't know. And she just laughed and laughed and laughed, and she finally left. And Jim turned to me and said, poor kid, he says, she'll never work in this business again. <laughs> I thought it was great. <laughs> uh, and uh, we also had a woman who I thought would make a really, really good um, uh, main wife for, um, for Twilly. And I don't remember her name, but she played the bride in Robert Altman's movie, A Wedding. She came in in Red Fort and it was like, oh yeah, I could see her in this part. She did a real good job. We weren't generally in the casting um, for these things, but and, and it's, it's re if you're an actor, you know, to have a writer um, watch you read, you know, we've already seen the show when we wrote it. We see it in our heads. Right. So we have a picture of what you look like and we have a picture of what you sound like. So I could walk into a, a casting um, session and just look around the room and go, oh, no, 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 without even hearing them read, which is completely unfair, just the way it works. Wow. So. I guess it makes sense. Yeah. Terry, just uh, one one last question from, from, uh, from me. Uh, you the way you were talking about uh working it out when you guys would write out your your uh your scripts there was no writer's room correct there's no writer's room no no not on that show no it was the only people were that were writing were jim and i don belisario and glenn that was it so wow so there's just... no no meeting uh, of the minds and then writing it out and like like the typical meeting of the minds well, you, you guys would... well if when we had time other than for murder on the rising star um and we probably even then we probably did some kind of a beat sheet um with this happens and then this happens and this happens and then this happens in this particular act and this is and then here's the cliffhanger um so Don could look at it and say, yeah, I'll go ahead and do that. Um, but for the rest of it, um, I mean, we just did it on instinct. We, you know, you know, we're, we were always good at, at coming up with stories. I remember he and I were at, at some college giving a, uh, a lecture and uh, one of the people who was shepherding the thing said, hey, how about if we throw you out a, a, a an idea let's see what you do with it and they threw out some idea to us and jim worked and i worked out a whole story in like five minutes so that was kind of fun i've never forgotten that oh man that is so cool um <laughs> so you just you just got to be quick on your feet and just be able to put this together um what uh john john you know, van gostein wanted to know what was uh what were some of your science fiction influences? What influenced your writing? Um, when I was a kid, I read everything that Ray, ba Ray Bradbury could write. I just devoured him, and I got to meet him many, many, many times over the years. Um, I enjoyed Richard Matheson a lot. Um, I think I was about nine when I read The Incredible Shrinking Man. Um, and I knew his, his son and his daughter, who were also writers of the business. In fact, his daughter, Allie Marie Matheson, uh, worked for me when I was doing animation. Um, I read a little bit of Fritz Lieber. Um, when I was older, I read, I've read every single Dune book that there is, everything by oh, Frank, Frank Herbert, Herbert and yeah. his son. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I got to meet him before he passed away and, uh, Arthur C. Clarke, I just love his stuff too. So it, 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 so in terms of reading, those were influences, um, in terms of movies, um, I was influenced big time by Forbidden Planet. Um, one of my friends, uh, Bill Malone, uh, owned Robbie the Robot. 
for many, many years afterwards. And I think he sold it for like $5 million oh my the last couple of years. Um, wow. That's me, Ray, and Ray Harryhausen influenced me, influenced a lot of people when we were, we were kids. Um, and maybe the time machine. Um, but I've always loved people with imagination. You know, I mean, I don't like the Godfather. I adore it. But it's also the people that could think way outside the box and um, and make it entertaining and just uh, jaw-droppingly interesting. So uh, how about some advice for aspiring writers, Terry? Once again, Pete, you froze. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, was, uh, I was uh, I was saying, how about some advice for aspiring uh, writers? Okay, um, the first thing you need to do is write. <laughs> Seriously, uh, it's the second thing you need to do is read. Um, when I was a kid, um, I watched tons of movies. Um, you know, I mean, it was the basic stuff that kids watch, like King Kong and maybe the Three Stooges and, um, you know, cartoons. Um, but then as you get a little bit older, you get started, start to get a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, I was lucky that I was brought up at a time when the film business was changing. So it wasn't the studio didn't have to grow up watching Andy Hardy. Um, I got to grow up watching Days of Wine and Roses about alcoholism, and um, I got to uh, and To Kill a Mockingbird um, and adult theme things. And I was watching these when I was a teenager. I was like fourteen. Doctor Strangelove, like, holy hmm. smoke! I, these stories are told, and somehow, because I watched them all the time, I couldn't get enough of it. I would just eat them up, just devour them. Um, the, the idea of story structure just rubbed off on me. I wasn't looking for it. When I got into this business, before I got into this business, I wanted to be a veterinarian. I was in pre-vet school. Um, and it's, it's just because when I started it with Jim, I had no idea how to write a script. I didn't even know what they looked like. And when we teamed up, you know, he, I called him when, when Ken Johnson said, um, yeah, I could pitch, and then we, we went in. And so we went in with stories, but I sat down with him, and all, I just automatically knew how to build a story or how to, you know, every every act, every story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Every act has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Every scene has a beginning, a middle, of an, and an end. So if you keep all that in mind and, each, and you make sure that each, each and everything that you do moves the plot forward um, instead of stands there as a stage weight um, where nothing is happening. Um, it, 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 that's something you should do. You should also take writing, uh, creative writing classes, I think. Um, but um, it's, it's not easy. I don't envy you if you're going into this, seriously. <laughs> it's very, very tough. Oh, I, and also, let, me, let me just say one one other thing. I want to I want to just say that um, how much I appreciate everybody who's who's tuned in to this, um, because, uh, like I said before, we don't know what we what we do when we write. We we write and we're moving on to something else, and we don't know how it's going to affect you or if you're going to accept it or not. We're we're basically writing for ourselves because we know that what we've written works at least to some degree. Um, and um, people always called me, well, if anybody calls me McDonald, I get furious <laughs> because I come from a, a small town on the outer island. It was four and a half miles square. Um, there were about 12,000 people in it. I'm just a kid from a small town who got lucky. Um, I had a dream. I put everything on the line. I had a little bit of talent and I came out here and I did it. So I'm no different than you, um, other than the luck and the serendipity of this business. 
So I appreciate you guys and um, and thank you for for taking the time to 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 listen to uh, some war stories. Oh, we we we're glad we uh, we're glad you did give us some war stories. These are amazing. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Terry, just a, a couple of last comments. Then um, I'm just gonna throw this out. It's it's really rare that that you know what I'm gonna say has any resonance of any kind. But are you still in touch with anyone from the old show? Um, I've seen I've seen um, um, Lorette uh, from time to time, um, who I adore. Um, at, I've seen uh, uh, Sarah Rush, who played Ry Rigel, mm -hmm. um, at, at uh, an autograph show. I've seen Annie Lockhart at a couple of autograph shows. <clears throat> I used to see Richard there. Um, uh, and we, you know, we had our Galactica conventions, too. So I was at those with them when I wasn't working. Um, and and uh, Herb Jefferson, I think I see more than anybody. I love Herb. I think he's fabulous. It's Boomer. Yep. Yeah, he just lives a few blocks from me. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, Terry, um, you know there's talk of a new Battlestar Galactica emerging. Um, a new one? Yeah. A new one. I have no idea. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, so there's two. Uh, so one is a series that they're going to run off the old 2004. Uh, so it's not going to follow the same Battlestar uh, Galactica that we're familiar with. But the they've uh, Universal, I believe, is who owns it now, uh, has green-lighted a movie uh, based on the original Battlestar Galactica. No way. Yeah. So who, if... Who, who, who... Who's involved? Do you know? Uh, I've got the names. I don't remember them off the top of my head. I, I think Peacock is one of the uh, yeah groups that are doing yeah, one but of the do two. Do you know who who uh, the yeah, producer I, might I, be? I got the producer's name. I can look it up here in a second. It starts with a K. He did um, Cronus. Uh, Seth, <laughs> yeah, Cronus. Commander Cronus. <laughs> 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 but. Uh, yeah, I can I can look it up and send it to you because I can't think of it at the top of my head. Maybe somebody will, will pop it in in the uh, uh, the comments while we're sitting here talking about it. But that would um, be great. I would love that. Yeah. So uh, he's uh, he's looking to uh, to do that, uh, do a do do a movie, and I think they're looking to base it on the original show. If they were to do something like that, um, what direction would you like to see it go in? I'm not. I, I, I don't know. It's a really good question, but but I honestly don't because I I know that at the at the very last episode episode that we did, um, was the hand of God, right? Which, by the way, the original title was the, the finger of God, but ABC said that was too dirty. <laughs> so that's why I'm serious. Oh my! I'm serious. Uh, so we had to change that. Um, but um, although we didn't know when Apollo was landing on the moon in that episode, we didn't know if it was the past or the future. I don't want them anywhere near Earth. I don't think that's where the story is. I never did like um, the, the, the Galactic in 1980. Um, <laughs> as, I, as I recall. Um, but but um, I, I just don't want him to find Earth. I want him to be out in space. I want to know the, the personal stories that are going on. Um, and I want the Cylons, if we're going to have Cylons, to be dangerous. You know, I, I want there to be a life and death situation because um, otherwise it, nobody's going to go see that. Right. Here you remember you that one episode that they did called, that we referred to as... Uh, I forget what the episode was, but it was we called it a little house on the planet. Oh, um, it was with <laughs> Lost Warrior. With, with, yeah. What What was it? I think it was the Lost Warrior. Was that with Was that where Ray Bolger was in it? Yes. Yeah. Oh my God, that was hideous. <laughs> and the, <laughs> and, and, 
That's the what made, show I don't what, like. What what even made it more hideous was that Glenn's kids were in it. Oh yeah. Yes. It's like fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, you, you don't have enough money. Let's let's uh let's put your kids in it now. Yeah. So uh <laughs> so here you go. Michael I found, Leslie. I found it online here. Ready? Uh so here it is. Uh Simon Kinberg is the producer Set and the writer. For, uh, Send it the, to me if yeah, you can. The X Men franchise. Um, so this is going to be oh. Uh, so Variety's can Cri- a couple of different people who confirmed it. So go ahead, go ahead, Pete. Uh, That's I very have, cool. Uh, a a uh, Terry, uh, Michael Leslie will write and produce. Uh, creator and showrunner of the AMC spy drama The Little Drummer Girl is tackling the scripts for the new BSG. And that's uh, with uh, Esmail. Esmail. That's, that's the uh, that's the series Sam and Esmail. not the movie. Yeah, that's, yeah, the, that's series the series, and not the movie. Right. So there's there's two separate yeah. uh, productions going on. So and the so, series is going to follow the series is going to follow the 2004 style timeline. Yeah. So hopefully the the movie okay. will be I don't know closer to our beloved uh, Galactica. Oh, I hope so. I hope so too. <laughs> All right, so well, we've it's we've probably uh, we probably need to. It's we've taken up a whole lot of your time. I really appreciate you being on on here for us, and uh, perhaps we can do another uh, another time to- an, another meeting another interview another time. Uh, and any time. Some more. This was this was a lot of fun. Um. So yeah, we would love to have you back on and uh, and do some more uh, in depth and maybe start talking about uh, some of your work with uh, we know you did a lot of work on Jeopardy you've got like 16 don't quote me on that uh, primetime Emmys um, for uh, I, have, I have 16 nominations nominations okay nominations I have five Emmys five yeah. Emmys so and, and a lot of that was due to your uh, your work on uh, different game shows and then of course you had mask uh, and you've had the Six Million Dollar Man and uh, Ionic Ionic Woman, Woman, and uh, all of those other great, great shows that uh, that you've written for and uh, and produced. Uh, so we'd love to have you back, and, and we can talk about some of those too. Fantastic! I'd be happy to. Absolutely, Terry. Thank you so much. It's been a great honor. Uh, it's been a pleasure to, to get to talk to you and get to know you a little bit. And man. Uh, the stories, uh, you know, my, I was telling Chris that if uh, I got to talk to my 12-year-old self and tell him <laughs> that I met you and talked to you, he'd be proud of me. So thank you. Yeah. It's my pleasure, Pete. We're going to be friends for a long time, I know. <laughs> it's so uh, I hope so. I you hope too, so. Chris. Yeah, thanks, sure. thanks. Yeah. This was a lot of fun. And it's so important that we capture this information uh for future fans or for present fans and future fans, uh, there's going to be uh, a newer generation maybe with the newer movie. So I think it's something that's uh, that we wanted to get on here and, and get you, uh, oh, yeah. get your, get your, you know, I don't like saying stories because that sounds like they're, they're fake, but your experience. No, it's experiences. Yeah. Uh, so thank you so much again. And you're uh, very welcome. guys. Thank, and, and thank the audience too, for, for being oh, yeah. here. Appreciate and uh, we'll, if we could, we'll probably, uh, there were some questions we didn't get to out in the audience. So uh, y'all don't uh, be upset. We'll, uh, we'll uh, send those out to Terry and get those answers for you. And uh, we'll type them in the comment section so you have the answers for those. So thanks uh, everyone for tuning in. Terry, thank you again uh, for uh, being with us. And um, Chris, uh, Tipsy Toaster, we have some other great things and uh some other great uh shows coming up and, and again terry we we hope we can have you back and you know we're going to look to do some charity work in the future uh we're going to do some trivia and uh some other interviews so um uh, thanks everyone for tuning in uh terry again thank you so much it's been such a great time talking with you uh chris any last words yep uh just a couple of last words if uh, if you haven't done so already uh, don't forget to follow us on uh, YouTube and Twitter and don't forget to hit that like button and the uh, follow button right here on Facebook uh, so that uh, that's uh, really important that we get those uh, the numbers up on those 
uh, once again, we're we're not for profit. We don't make any money on this deal. Uh, we're just uh, I want to consider us digital uh, archivists as that uh, for Battlestar Galactica, other si and other science fiction shows that are out there. So, if you get a chance, uh, go ahead and hit those uh, likes and everything else. And uh, with that, uh, Pete, uh, you know, I guess we can call it a night. I really appreciate uh, everybody being here and um, tuning in. Oh, well, Pete, if, get something else. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if, if Terry's still on with us, uh, one last uh, favor, if you will, Terry, if you could just uh, uh, give us a plug and uh, we'd really appreciate it. What do you what do I say? What do you what do you want me to say? <laughs> Uh, if you just uh, give it, tell well, everybody to you know tune into IFB Interfleet uh, Broadcasting, uh, you know who you are, and we'd appreciate it. Oh sure. Hi, this is Terrence McDonnell um, from Battlestar Galactica. Um, take a look at Interfleet Broadcasting; it's really cool. I'm on it. <laughs> All right, thank you. Perfect. Of course. Thank you. Have a great holiday, Chris. Uh, Yep. Terry, have a great holiday as well. Uh, you know, for those uh, fans that are too, actually uh, celebrating, like we had said earlier, Hanukkah, Christmas, there's New Year's coming up, and all the great stuff. Uh, although it's a pandemic, uh, everyone, please stay safe. Wear your masks. Uh, the vaccine's coming out soon. And um, don't listen to the Cylons. I don't know <laughs> what kind of stuff they're going to put in your head. But uh, we're all going to go out. We're all going to take the shots. And I think there is light at the end of the tunnel. Yes. So, all right, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, we will catch you again. Don't forget to tune in. Uh, don't forget to follow. So, uh, you know, when we go live again uh, next time. Thank you so much.